Hello, my name is Luke Perkin, and I'm going to do a brief series on how to program a computer. So this is a sidebar to my uh, other series about how to program a synthesizer in C. Um, I thought I'll take a bit of a detour and explain a bit more about how processes and memory works and how you end up writing instructions for a computer that moves memory around, because that's all that a program really is. So yeah, my name's Luke Perkin. I'm a freelance technical designer in the games industry. I've been doing this for about uh, since 2016, 2017 now, and I've been in software development since 2014. So I thought I'll give you my take on how to program a computer. Um, so let's look at a computer. So you can think of a computer as made up as four parts. You've got the processor, You've got your memory chips, i.e. RAM. You've got output, such as your display monitor, or you could be a server, so your output could be a network cable. And you've got your inputs, like your mouse and keyboard. So well, the processor is essentially um, something that listens and executes instructions. You give it a list of instructions, and a processor will run through those instructions precisely and accurately. Um, those instructions could be things like uh, read such and such memory, perform some calculations on it, and then store that memory again. And it's going to run through those instructions pretty quickly. And nowadays, modern uh, processors, they have multiple cores, so it was a bit like having multiple chefs in a kitchen all following their own recipe. Um, yes, so let's have a look at memory. So the easiest way to think of what memory looks like is a spreadsheet. Essentially, you have a whole array of cells, and each cell can hold a certain amount of data, and you can uh, access those cells via an address. For example, access cell B1, access cell C2. And so a processor is really just a series of instructions, such as get whatever's in cell B2. Step 2, multiply that number by 2. Step three, store the result in cell C3. That's really what a process is doing, and it's doing it at speed. So I have a, a program to help teach you this. So let's give this a go. Here we go. So this is a little tool I've made to help understand how to program computers. So as you can see here, we have what is basically the spreadsheet. We have a whole bunch of cells with numbers in them, and each cell is numbered from zero, and it increases. Nine, 10, 11, then as you come to the next row, um, goes 12, 13. So we don't use letters like A1, B2, we just number them in increasing order up to here. And then on the left here, we have a series of instructions that the processor is going to step through and execute in order. Um, so at the moment, we're seeing uh, just the numeric representation of what in those cells. I can, I can then see what is the uh, te textual representation. Um, in a computer, everything is numbers, but we can represent those numbers in various ways. So in this case, I can represent those numbers as characters. You can even see up here, I've got a sort of a black and white image. We can represent numbers as pixels on a screen, where zero, would be black, and the highest number, in this case 255, I'll explain that later, uh, is white. So using the arrow keys on my keyboard, I can step through each instruction. So let's look at the first instruction that the processor is going to execute. It says write, then the letter H, and then cell 1. So this is going to write the letter H into cell 1. There. And so on, I'm just going to write the letter E into cell 2. I can keep stepping through. And then finally, we're going to write 0 into cell 7. And that's going to make it blank. But if I go back to the number representation, you can see here, here is 0. You can see, look, 76, 76, both the same. That's because the letters are the same. And then the final instruction, I'm going to ask it to print the text. I'm going to print the text at cell 1 to our output. Now imagine that the output would be 
the monitor attached to a computer. And you'll notice it's printed all the text, hello, up until the question mark. How did it know to print just that and not all this other gibberish after it? Well, we've just made what we call a zero terminated text or null terminated. So the process is going to start, we said print text cell one, starts at cell one, it's going to read each letter in turn until it reaches a blank or an empty spot, a zero, and then it's going to stop. That's what we call null terminated. This is great. All right, let's play around with some more things. So here's my code that I can supply to the processor. Let us delete that. And I'm going to show you something that you might not have thought of. So I'm going to write the number 255 to cell 1. And then I'm going to write the number 1 to cell 2. And then we're going to add whatever's in cell 1 to whatever's in cell 2. And we're going to store the result in cell 3. Now, you might be able to guess what this is going to do. Um, if you've never worked with sort of low-level memory before, this might surprise you. So here we go. You can see it's written 255 to cell 1. It's written 1 to cell 2, and now it's going to tell us it's going to add the result, whatever's in cell 1 and whatever's in cell 2 together, and it's going to store the result in cell 3. Now, common sense says we'll get the 256, but we don't. We get 0. Now, the reason for this is each cell in memory is, is of finite space. We can only st store so much information within a single cell. And it just so happens that the maximum number we can store is 255. Or rather, we can store 256 unique values in a cell. Now, you might be thinking, why such an arbitrary number? Well, it's not arbitrary. If I come to my calculator, you see, in a computer, everything's stored in binary, where a number can only be of a 0 or a 1. And each cell represents a byte. A byte are 8 bits. And the way to work out how much data any amount of bits can hold um, is a very simple formula. It's just 2 to the power of However, however many bits you have. So we just said a byte is 8 bits, so it's 2 to the power of 8, and you can see here 256. The reason why 255 is the max is we count from 0, which is why it's 1 less than 256. So let me clarify this again. We've got 255 going to cell 1. What if we make 2? We put 2 into cell 2, and now we're adding 255 plus 2. So, as a comment, for, um, when I do slash slash, it's basically saying to the processor, ignore, ignore this, this is just for me, it's just a note for myself. So basically we're doing 255 plus 2, what does that equal? Well, let's give this a go. Write 255, we write 2, now we get 1. What is going on there? So we, we know we can't go any higher than 255. So this is what is called overflow. The number would have overflowed above 255 and it wraps all the way back round to zero. Um, think of it like Pac-Man. When you go off the right side of the screen, you end up coming back on the left. The same happens um, with numbers in memory. If you go over the maximum number, it overflows and wraps around back to zero and then starts counting up again. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's see um, what else we can do. How about if we just try and write a program that prints the numbers um, one to 10? So we could do this the obvious way. We just write one in cell one. And I need to copy this 10 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So we're gonna write two to cell two, one to three, cell three. I'll just do this as quickly as possible. Uh. Seven, eight, nine, 
10. And we need to do the same for the cell numbers. So you just saw me tying that in and that was pretty tedious. But it works. We run through. Now we got numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Nice thing about this is we can also go back and forward. So obviously writing code instruction like this, it gets very tedious. Um, it's very easy to make a mistake. So there's a way we can uh, create what we call uh, loops. So let me, let me go back to the program. So you notice we have four numbers at the top here labeled A, B, C, and D. These are called registers. So you can think of the, this big spreadsheet of memory that exists in your RAM. But these registers are like a very small, tiny bit of memory that exists directly on the processor itself. And the usefulness of having a little bit of memory on the processor means it can access them very fast. Whereas trying to access memory from uh, RAM or from even disk is super slow, but from RAM is comparatively very slow compared to accessing and sort of storing numbers in registers. And I can showcase this. So you notice every time we do an instruction, we have a clock. So this clock is counting how many uh, cycles that the processor is going through. And you notice every time we write a number, it goes up by 100. Let's see what happens when we uh, write to a register as well. So to write to a register, you just do register A. Let's write this to register B, register C, and register D. Notice it's very fast. The clock only goes up by one. So this is another thing that you sort of have to think about when programming is that it's so much faster to work with uh, the memory that's closest to the CPU, the processor, than it is to uh, grab memory from RAM. Uh, so let me change this back. So we were trying to think of a way to make this less tedious to write and less error prone as well. So one thing we can do is let's get rid of all of this. Is we can say we can put in a checkpoint. I'm going to call this checkpoint loop. I'm going to call this loop start. So a checkpoint, you know, it's a bit like in a video game when you reach a checkpoint. Um, if you ever die, you teleport back to that checkpoint. So we're going to write one to cell one. And then, um, in fact, no, we're going to write whatever's in register A to cell one. And then we're going to add whatever's in register A to whatever's in cell one. And we're going to store the result of that back into register A. So we, we now know that, oh, and by the fault, in my program, in this, by the fault, register A is always set to one. So that's a nice little thing to know. So we now know that um, we're writing the number one into cell one, and then we're gonna add one to one. So we're gonna get two into register A. Then we're gonna call a new instruction called jump. If above zero. What is going on here? So we're gonna jump back to a checkpoint. I'm going to jump back to loop start, but only if the value in register A is above zero, which we know that's true. So let's give this a go. So we set the checkpoint. We're going to write one into cell one. Ah. So we've, we've reached our first book. So when we write 
um, we're writing a literal number and it just so happens that uh, register the address of register A equals 72. So what we need to do is actually copy. We need to copy whatever's in cell. We need to copy one cell to another cell. So we use the term copy cell to cell. So we're going to copy whatever's in register A to cell 1. Let's give this another go. So we set our checkpoint. Done. We're going to copy register A into cell 1. We're going to add 1 and 1 and store the result in register A. And we're going to jump if A is above 0, which it is. And you'll notice this will just keep on going. And then eventually we didn't jump, we reached the end. What happened there? Let's go back. Notice once we uh, got to two, well, we were copying two into cell one. And then we're gonna add two to two. So actually we're not incrementing A by one every time, we're doubling it. And you can see that goes four and eight. 16, 32, 64, 128, and then 0, 0, because what's 128 plus 128? It's 256, which is 1 over 255, which means it wraps back to 0. And now the jump if is above 0. Well, it's not above 0, it's 0, so it's not going to jump, and it's going to reach the end of the program. So what we need to do is we need to store that one somewhere else that we can always refer to. Um, so we know I'm going to copy reg A to re register B. And then when we're adding, we're going to add register A and register B. So now B is equal to 1. Set our checkpoint. I'm going to increase register A by 1. I jump. And if I just keep going, you'll notice now the number's just going to count up. Fantastic. So now we also want to tell it to not just keep writing it to cell 1, we then want to tell it to write in turn to cell 2 and cell 3 and cell 4. How can we do that? Well, this requires a different instruction. We want to copy whatever's in register A, not to cell 1, but we want to copy it to whatever cell, basically, we want to copy it to whatever cell register A is referring to. So this is called uh, indirect jump. Yeah, so we're copying cell to indirect. Let me explain. So first instruction, we just copy one into B, then we set our checkpoint. And now look at this. Cell one is highlighted blue because we're doing copy cell to indirect. So we're copying whatever the value is in register A to whatever the cell number is of register A. So A is now referring to cell number one. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to increment A and jump. And notice now it's pointing to cell two because A, A's value is two. And we've got a loop. We're now counting. Now the only problem now is that this is just going to keep going and count up forever until it reaches the end by which point it will probably crash or just go weird because once you go off the end uh, it starts writing into registers because of the way this program is structured. So we need to tell it to stop at some point. Um, let's tell it to stop at cell 10. 
So what register haven't we used yet? We've not been using register C. So we're gonna write 10 into register C. So that's gonna be our stop point. And then we basically need to ask the question, um, are two values equal? Is register A equal to register C? Right? We're asking, is the value in register A equal to the value in register C? And then we need to store the results of this question, the answer to this question. We're going to store that in register D. So if it is equal, register D will be set to 1. If it's not equal, it'll be set to 0. And we can use this jump if above 0. So if it is equal, we're going to do another jump if it's above 0. We're going to jump to, well, we need another checkpoint to jump to. So I'm going to create a checkpoint down here called finished. So we're going to jump to finished if register D is above zero. Or in other words, we're going to jump to here if A, register A is equal to 10. Otherwise, it's going to come to the processor will ignore this line and come to this line and then jump back to the beginning. Let's give this a go. So we write 10 to C, copy 1 to B, set our loop checkpoint. We're going to copy 1 to cell 1. We're going to add 1 to A. We're going to check is A and B equal? No, 2, 10, they're different. So D will be set to 0. We're going to jump if D is above zero, it's not. We're going to jump if A is above zero, it is. And then we're going to repeat the process. Oh, and look here. Let me go back a step. We're now on the line that asks, is A and C equal? Yes, they are. So have a look at what gets stored in D. The number one. And now what? Jumping to finished if register D is above zero. That's correct. And then we reach the end. Uh, notice now that we've, we've got numbers uh, 1 to 9, and that's because we set our endpoint to 10. Um, so the way it finished, it finished before it got a chance to write to 10. Um, so if we wanted it to write the number 10, then we, we need to write the number 11, one higher. And then I'll just fast forward this through. There we go, we got numbers one to 10. So this is pretty much what you're doing when you're programming a, a computer. Um, often this is what you'll see as assembly code. Uh, usually we have a programming language that is a little nicer to read and has uh, different sort of more useful constructs. And then that programming language will be converted into instructions like this that the processor can understand. So there's a few other points I wanted to make. And that is, let me close this and reopen it. Notice, unlike say Excel spreadsheet, when you open a new sheet, you get a nice blank a whole bunch of blank cells. Whereas we open this and look, there's just a whole bunch of random numbers. And if we go to the textual representation, it's just gibberish. Why, why did I do this? So my computer's already been running for a while uh, before I launched the application. And it has to, there's only so much memory that's on my computer. So when it asks, when my program asks for memory, anything could already be in that memory that was in there. Unless the programmer of the previous programs made made it such they cleared it out to zero, um, anything could be there. So this is what we call uninitialized memory. And it's something you have to watch out for when you're programming, especially in languages like C and C++. Um, so often when we get a block of memory like this, we have to initialize it. And all that means is to say, we're gonna write a region of memory so we're going to write 0 from cell 1 to cell 71. 
So I'm going to write zeros into this region of cells. There we go. Oh, and it's non-inclusive, so it's actually to cell 72. So it's, it's from cell 1 up to cell 72, but not including. Because obviously we can see cell 72 doesn't exist. And there we go. And then there's another thing you've noticed, it's this red exclamation mark in cell 0. What's all that about? Well, typically you should never read memory address zero. Um, that's often a sign of a, a mistake you've made in the code. Um, usually memory address zero is reserved for catching uh, mistakes like this. Okay. So let's have a look at how this might translate between this sort of pseudo assembly code to C. So we're going to try and convert this to C. Um, let's create a new file and call this um, conversion.c. So I'm going to open this up here in the side. So what's this doing? Well, if you've been watching um, my creating a synthesizer in C videos, uh, I talked about creating arrays. So an array looks something like this. Uh, we're going to do 72. So this is creating a bunch of numbers. Int, remember int here stands for integer. Um, but actually, we're going to do ch uh, char because a char is more like what we what's in our program because a char is one byte, whereas usually an integer, an int, um, depending on platforms, it's usually four bytes. Yep. Uh, so to stay close to the representation, um, it's actually going to be an unsigned char. Uh, so this means uh, the numbers can be from 0 to 255, whereas if it was a assigned char, I mean it can go negative. So it could be negative 127 to positive 127. That makes sense. So we're going to call these our cells. So ignoring, ignoring this for now, when we write 11, and then we're going to have um, our registers. Oh, let, me, let me call these unsigned again. So we're going to have our register A, B, C, and D. And remember, a was equal to one by default, and the rest were equal to zero by default. So what's this doing? Write 11. So to do this in C, it's pretty simple. You just do red C equals 11. That's an instruction. Copy cell to cell. We want to copy whatever's in reg A to reg B. Very easy. We just say what well, reg B is equal to reg A. That's a copy. Checkpoint, uh, we'll get back to. Uh, but we can do a block, a braces. These two braces um, specify a block of code. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll get back to this. But for now, let's just, in comments, same thing in comments, we'll say, all right, loop start. Now look at this, copy cell to indirect. So we want to copy whatever reg A is, but to the cell. So it's not this. This isn't copy to copy. We're not copying itself into itself. We're actually getting cells and whatever is stored on register A. So this is array access. 
So if we, we specifically wanted to copy into cell one, we'd put one. So this is the same as a uh, copy cell to indirect. And then add, we're adding whatever's in reg A to reg B and storing the result in reg A. That's pretty simple. It's just equals reg A plus reg B. That's add. Uh, is equal. Um, in C, we use the if construct. We say if reg A is equal to reg C. This is a uh, two equals, by the way. Equals equals. Whereas we do one equal sign if we want to copy a value. Notice I'm starting another block of code here. So the code inside this block will only be run if this expression is true. So we don't even need to store the result in reg D. That's implicit now. And then if it is, well, C does support a thing called go to. Let's see. Uh, we're just going to quickly learn about the C go to statement um, label, go to label. So to do this, we just do loop start colon. So now we can say if that equals C, go to loop start. Otherwise, if register A is above zero, so that's the greater than, if A is greater than zero, oh sorry, this should be finished, and then this should be go to loop start. And then here we are finished, um, the end. So if this was a C program, we would have to uh, put this in a, uh, a main function. This is just so the operating system knows, you know, what's the start of our code. And we just return the number zero. Um, and then we do want to print the result. So in, to do that, we do need to include uh, standard io.h. You'll see me, I included this in my synthesizer video. So this just lets us print stuff to the screen. Um, so we're going to do printf. I'm going to print, we'll just print the first four numbers for now. So each of these percentage i uh, will get replaced with this list. So we can do cells one, cell, whatever's in cells, whatever in the cell three, and cells four. Now we need to compile this. As so we go TCC conversion and then run it. And look there. I don't know if that's big enough. But you can see the output was one, two, three, four. And you can see that's exactly the same as what we had here. And in fact, I can replicate that by using the uh, instruction print numbers. We're going to print all the numbers from cell one to 
itself all. And we get the same output, one, two, three, four. So, let's have a look at some other things we can do. Um, another thing we can we can do in the the list of instructions is called label. So, for example, I could label one of the cells my own thing. So, I could label one of the monkey. So now I'm saying cell five, put a label on that, call it monkey. And now I can say, write the number eight to monkey. Let's give this a run. So we're just applying a label to cell five. And then look, we've got write eight monkey and it's highlighted cell five because it knows monkey when we say monkey, we really mean cell five. I'm going to write the number eight to that. So if, if you're to write this uh, in a programming language like C, that would basically be monkey equals eight. Because typically the uh, the language will give you the, the cell location automatically. So we don't even need to specify what cell monkey applies to because we'll get one automatically given to us, which is nice. Otherwise we would, we would, uh, we have to do something like monkey, um, I'm going to call the size T and then we would say, cells monkey equals eight. So that's another way you could represent these two instructions. All right, let's have a look at something even more complicated. I'm gonna look at the bubble sort. Here we go, I'm gonna copy all this paste it. So this is a much bigger program. Let me close you, 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 send this back to here. All right, let's have a look at this. So what is this going to do? This is going to sort numbers into ascending order. Let's, um, let me change this now to 10. So it's going to start at cell three. All the numbers between cell three and cell 10 are going to get sorted. Let me show you. Oh, look, there's so much code that goes off the screen. So bear with me. I'm going to set the font size to 10. Okay. <laughs> So remember, I said it's going to sort all the numbers between three and 10. So you can see all the numbers here, they're not in ascending order, they're all jumbled up. If I hold the down button, it's just going to run through it. And there we go. All the numbers between three and 10 are now in ascending order. If you look at the pixel representation up here, you can see it makes a nice gradient. And then you can see here, this set of numbers was the uns first unsorted, and then it's printed out the sorted result. Wow, okay, what is going on here? Let's reverse it. So the basic algorithm is to use cells one and two as a little working scratch pad. So let's step through this. The first thing we do is we just set up a few labels. Um, we're just gonna label a few cells that we use here and there. And then everything we're not using, 
we're going to clear out. So we just got the memory that matters. Um, and then we're going to print the numbers from start to end. As you can see, it's going to print all the numbers between cell 3 and cell 10 to the output. And then it's going to print a tab character. So when we come to print the final result, there's a little bit of space. And then remember I said cell 1 and 2 is going to be a working scratch pad. So we're going to clear those two out. And then we're going to write our starting index, which is cell 3, to A. And our ending index, which is cell 10, to B. So now we can see we're going to go from cell 3 to cell 10. That's what we're sorting. And then we're going to set up our checkpoint sort. So we're going to, going to keep coming back to this checkpoint over and over again as we're, look, as we're doing this uh, algorithm. So here we have copy indirect to cell. You saw before we had copy cell to indirect. Well, this is the inverse. It's going to copy whatever the value is in cell 3. Or it's going to look at register A, and then it's going to hop to that cell, get that value, and it's going to store the result in cell 1. And then we're going to increase A by 1. And then we're going to get whatever's in cell 4 and store that in cell 2. So you can see now we've got the first two values in our list of sortable numbers in our working scratch pad. And now we're going to compare them. We're going to see if um, this value is less than this value. And we're going to store the result in register C. And you can see it's not less than. And then we have a jump here, a jump if above zero. It's going to jump to another checkpoint called a head if and only if C is above zero, which is not. So it, what it's going to then do is copy this back to cells 4 and 3, um, but in reverse order. So effectively, what we've done now is we've swapped the positions of these two numbers. And you can see that here. When we copied it, we got 186 and 59. But now 3 and 4, they go 59, 186. So we've sorted these two cells. Then we're going to increment A again. Here's the checkpoint ahead. We would have jumped to this if C was above 0. Now let's see. Is equal A, B, store the result in D. So we're seeing if... A is equal to B, nope, so that's going to be 0. And if it is 0, jump if 0, we're going to jump all the way back to sort. And there it is again. I notice now, in the first iteration of the loop, A was at 3, but now we're at 4. So we're now going to compare these two numbers and swap them. If, if they need be. Let's... Uh, So we can see 186 is already lower than 222. So C is going to get set to 1. Jump if above 0. Jump to a head. It is going to. So look, it's going to jump all the way down here. And now we're just at the point where we're checking if these two registers are equal. They're still not equal. So we're going to jump back to sort. And you'll notice it's going to keep doing this in pairs. Going to check these two. Swap them if they're out of order. Then it's going to check these two. Swap them if it's out of order. Then it's going to check these two. until we reach the end. Oh, I think I missed. Let me rewind a bit. Here we go. So we have our code here, jump if equal. Now 10, A is equal, we've reached the end. So what happens now? Well, we're not going to jump back to sort. Instead, we're going to subtract 1 from B. So now this is going to become 9. And then we're going to write the start and the index 3 back to A again. 
and then we're going to check if they're equal, they're not. Otherwise, now we're going to jump back to start. So we're going to do the whole thing again, only this time we're not going to compare the last two values, 9 and 10. And you'll see this will keep repeating, we'll do that. And then B will become 8, so we'll, we'll go through and sweep, not sort them again, except we won't compare 8 and 9. And you can sort of see this. What, if you watch B, it's slowly reducing, so it's going to get faster and faster and faster until eventually A and B will be the same, and we get the sorted output. This is called bubble sort, um, because what happens is high values, they sort of bubble up to the end, and low values at the end, they bubble to the beginning. Let me uh, play this again so you can get a sense for that. Let me go back to uh, this view. So watch the zero bubble towards the beginning. And the high values bubbled up. So this is effectively what we're writing uh, when we're creating programming languages. Except we, we uh, typically have some useful constructs, especially when it comes to looping. So to give you an example, um, here we use the go to construct for looping. So this is a fairly primitive construct. Um, usually we might do something like while. While is thing true, we will keep on looping everything in here. So um, let's convert this into this while construct. So we've got here, if register A is greater than zero, we go back to loop start. Well, that becomes our question. While register A is greater than zero, we're just going to keep looping everything in here. So we're going to copy this. We're going to set whatever the value of register A is indirect. Then we're going to add, there's a nicer way uh, to express this as well. We can, instead of doing register A equals itself plus B, we can do plus equals B. It's exactly the same as this line. And then we're going to take this expression here. If register A is equal to B. We're introducing a new keyword here called break. What that's going to do, it's going to break out of the loop and come to here, this point outside the loop. Um, so let me, let me, uh, that. so this, all this is exactly the same as this. And you can see it's a little bit more compact. Um, it'll be a little less error prone and easier to read for us human programmers. To the computer, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't care. The computer's just blindly following instructions um, as accurately as possible. So let's give this a go. Make sure it still works. Yep. Yeah. And you can see we still get one, two, three, four, it works exactly the same. Okay, so that was a brief overview of how to program a computer. Um, I'll probably try and put this up somewhere so you can have a play with it, maybe GitHub, and I'll, uh, I'll post a link or upload another video in the future about how you can get access to this little tool. Um, but really, it was just a tool that I made to help teach this concept of working with memory and thinking of it like a spreadsheet. Hopefully you found that helpful. Okay. Bye-bye now.